we obviously have an amazing panel of experts for you this morning. A lot of sort of uh, you know, creative power lined up here. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Jade Beer. I was the editor of Condé Nast Brides for about eight years. Um, I'm still at Condé Nast. I'm now working on Tatler as their events director. And so joining me this morning, we have Philippa Lepley. Uh, bridal fashion couturier with a reputation for the highest possible standards across all elements of her work. Philippa is trusted by some of the most discerning international clientele, not just for her exceptional craftsmanship, but also her total discretion. I can vouch for that personally. Her collections continue to evolve season after season, while somehow maintaining the crucial Philippa Lepley DNA. More than 30 years after opening her business, today she is known for her body sculpting corsetry, her obsessive attention to detail, and for retaining a team who are expert at their craft. One of the very first male wedding planners and designers in France, Jean Charles, is now synonymous with flawless service in lavish destinations. He is incredibly well-traveled, having visited over 60 locations around the world. Vanity Fair have declared him one of the most influential wedding planners in the world. Or that people have been queuing up to bestow awards on him. Perhaps, for now, it is best to simply say that the most luxurious suppliers and venues in the world all want to work with him and his company, Sumptuous Events. Emmy Scarterfield can count the likes of Jimmy Choo, Emma Hope, and Patrick Cox among her fellow alumni from the prestigious Corwainers College of Footwear and Fashion. She went on to work for the fashion houses of Giorgio Armani and Bottega Veneta before in 2004 setting up her own luxury lifestyle brand with bespoke bridal shoes and accessories at its heart. Today, Emmy London is housed in her stylish flagship store in the heart of Chelsea and is synonymous with quintessentially British style across her couture and ready-to-wear collections. Sam Bompas has been called many, many things. A food maverick, a culinary deviant, Willy Wonka's teenage son. As the co-founder of Bompas and Pard, give him his official title, he lives by the motto, excess is success. Um, having created foodie firsts like a chocolate waterfall, a breathable cloud of gin and tonic, a 4,000 calorie Victorian breakfast, and fireworks that could be tasted by the audience below them. All since launching the multi-sensory experience business Bon Pass and Par in 2007. He is a voracious reader, a collector of collaborators, and employed by some of the biggest brands in the world. Google, Diageo, Coca-Cola, Unilever. John Nazari has been searching for subjects to shoot since the age of 13. His now long and award-studied career has spanned the worlds of fashion, art and academia, portraiture, and of course, weddings. He's photographed royalty, political heavyweights, and thousands of brides. His work has been exhibited in London's National Portrait Gallery on three separate occasions, and he is brand ambassador for Olympus, a role that took him behind the scenes at the Mandarin Oriental Hotel here in London for several months to profile its diverse staff. He is perhaps best known for his pioneering 360-degree technology, which allows for panoramic views with interactive features and sound. Rob Van Helden, last but not least. If your business is only as good as your client list, then surely Rob is London's leading florist. He's created floral designs for Piers Brosnan's wedding, who, by the way, described him as the best flower guy I know, Elton John's white tie and tiara ball, royal weddings, film premieres, charity events, and some of the most glamorous international society parties. With more than 30 years' experience working in the UK and abroad, he stands alone in his determination to work directly with his clients himself, holding their hand through every step of the process to guarantee total perfection and client satisfaction. So that is quite a mega, mega panel of um, creative genius right there, I would say. Um, 
Sam, I was going to come to you first. What does being a creative force and a creative person actually mean for you? Uh, well, <laughs> so I'd like to pull apart creativity um, to start with. Uh, for, um, for myself, I studied geography. Um, I went and worked in, was it property PR um, for people like CBRE and Granger, doing their financial results, not doing anything very interesting. Um, and then started working, um, creating food and drink spectacles. So I never really thought of myself as being someone that's particularly creative. And at the studio, we don't have any special creatives. We, I mean, we really think that, um, in fact, everyone can come up with brilliant creative ideas. Um, in fact, if you sit down, you have a cup of tea with someone, you, you're at the, at the pub with people, um, often you'll be talking about wonderful ideas that you would like to realize. Um, the creativity just ends up being um, spending six months um, doing all the hard work, the logistics, the risk assessments, method statements, health and safety, um, to make it happen. Um, for myself, I'm trying to work out how to uh, put fireworks in a box that you can stand inside as you blow them up. Um, there's nothing creative about that, really. Um, it's just pretty ludicrous. My ears are still ringing from some of the tests last night. Creative practice, really, is, is um, you know, it's having those conversations that we probably all have with our friends about what we'd like to see, and then spending the time to make it happen. Thank you. Philippa, does it mean something different for you? Is it more about realising a fantasy moment? I think, I think you've got to be realistic. No fear of failure. Just go for it, but also slightly commercial and realistic about whether the fireworks will work in the box or whatever. Um, it's, I think if you've got any children who are really creative, let them do it. Let it, let it out. Um, it's, it's a funny thing, creativity, and running a business with 20 hats on. Um, so it's being realistic, but letting it out and, and, and finding something really special. But you work, have to work very hard to find that something very special. I might go on holiday and take a dummy with me and, and just at the end of the holiday be totally inspired because my brain has found some space and then probably design the best dress for, for the whole year. So um, it's always very interesting. Does anybody on the panel have a very different take on creativity? Does it mean something very different to any one of you? I, I think you know, we, we're all lucky enough you know, to be working with amazing people and making their dreams come true and it's like... Um, you know, when we do a wedding as well, you know, you, you do hold their hands. It's a journey you go on with and listen to the brides and the parents and everybody. And, you know, to make their big day the biggest day of their lives. But, um, and it, it's to listen to them, you know, and what, what are their ideas? And then to put a twist to it and keeping it tasteful and, you know, not getting carried away like, you know, people have got budgets these days and, you know, but we are lucky enough. And I always think, would I be happy if it was my wedding and walk into this ballroom and see what has been created? And, you know, I pinch myself every day after 30 years, you know, that we are still being given a chance to create beautiful things for people. Um, you know, styles have changed and everything. You try to go with the flow, but, you know, you keep your quality control and, and tasteful. You know, it's, uh, you know, I think we're all lucky. Yeah. Um, do you think that creativity is something that can be taught? Because I think sometimes, you know, the moment you sort of ask someone to be creative, sometimes you can almost feel them stiffening to concrete. It's like, my God, this is this moment I have to say something very clever or very interesting. Do you think if somebody isn't naturally creative or they don't think of themselves in that way, it can be taught? I mean, you are self-taught. You have got some creativity in you, but you learn over the years and you're not shying away to learn from other things and you know it's about traveling it's about places you go to you know we're all lucky enough to go to the most incredible homes and you pick up on things and you learn from people and you keep an open ear to new ideas and as well but you know things have changed so much you know we are the oldies and <laughs> over the last over 30 years you've seen so many new trends and everything and you know they are trends you know they're there for a period but then they change well but as long as you keep you know, running your own business with your own class and style for people to come back to you, I think is very important. Yeah. I think if you're lucky enough to go to art college and, and you sit there in, in the beginning and you, you're quite young um, and they teach you how to look at an object or look at a body and do life drawing, everybody's got something inside them, not, maybe not everybody, but people <laughs> can find and can be taught how to look at that body and draw it in a much better way. I, I certainly, you know, learned a lot at art college 
and it was all brought out in me and, and didn't realise how creative I was. I think, going back again, I think it's, it's very important for parents to let, even if I had very uncreative parents who didn't understand me at all, were petrified what was happening to me, um, but you've just got to let it out. But art college is brilliant, brilliant for that. But I do think maybe most people have a little bit in there, some a lot more than others. There's always those genius people who are super bright and super artistic. I'm employing one of those at the moment. Most annoying, but most brilliant. <laughs> um, so that, that's my take on creativity. And John? Um, uh, just going back to the first question about creativity, I think um, creativity is really about being yourself and having the bravery and um, confidence to be yourself. Um, and so I feel like in my role, as a designer, I'm very much putting my heart and soul on my sleeve, and um, sometimes that's quite scary. Um, in terms of can you be taught to be creative, I think there's, it's a really fine line. I do remember at college, I did kind of say something quite controversial, which I did live to regret, um, that my tutor was trying to teach me something, and I was like, well, I just think you've kind of got it, or you haven't. <laughs> and you know, it was quite a sort of a blunt thing to say, but actually I kind of believe that still. Um, however, I do, think you be, I do think you can be taught to think creatively, so not so much about coming up with ideas that relate to products, but to think creatively in today's world is absolutely vital, and I think everyone can be taught to do that, and everyone should be doing that. I think creativity was something you'd think about as within the aesthetic of a picture, like the frame of it. And art college kind of allowed you to explore different things. And then I kind of began to think about creativity as a concept. So, you know, it might be conceptual issues that are creative within an image. So you can't just construct a story and then there's a kind of conceptual kind of narrative around this, uh, what's being depicted. Um, and, but when I started weddings 12 years ago, I've already been a photographer for 16 years, um, and I saw creativity as within the aesthetics, so that kind of original kind of idea that um, I'm looking for something unusual in a, in a wedding. So I would look for reflections, I'd look for kind of moments, I'd shoot through things. Um, I chose my genre, which was kind of documentary, narrative, telling stories, um, and used that as the kind of street photography approach to telling um, uh, uh, a wedding story and using creativity through it. And I kind of find it's changed now, so now there's a sort of assumption that if you book me, you're booking that, and that is happening. Mm. Um, and then, so now I'm kind of thinking, when I look at what I do, that creativity is, is, is about uh, my brand, it's about, um, uh, it might even be about the way in which I might um, sell my brand or the team I select. You know, sometimes now I find actually I can't do those shots in the reflections because I'm expected at the cake to do the cake shot, which is actually <laughs> the easiest shot of everything, or a yeah. group shot where I've got to just put one light and press a button and then take some groups. So I, now in my team I bring in my creative colleagues because I've lost that space to maybe be creative and mm. because as the brand name and the face, I'm expected to do the cake or do the groups. So I would like look at my wider team and say, right, I want, I want Jeremy on this, I want Rio on that, I want Felix and so on. And I'd, I'd, sh I'd delegate so we deliver as a group, as a team. Okay. Uh, John Charles, would you hire somebody that you didn't perceive to be a creative person? No, I wouldn't hire someone creative in my team, you mean, mm. to execute my design or to do my own yeah. design? No, I, wa I want this to be by myself. Yeah. So I, I will hire someone who cannot do what I'm doing myself, like sales or marketing, but uh, yeah. design will be just myself. So the full creative process is always driven through you? Um, yes. Wow. <laughs> That's a lot of pressure to put on yourself, isn't it? Yeah, and actually I want to say something as well. I think to be creative, it takes courage. Mm -hmm. um, it's... Um, it's the needs to express yourself, and it's not easy to put this in words when you're an artist. Yeah. So. Can I, can I cast it? Yeah, you you take a very different approach, yeah. I think. Well, I've got I've got to say it's. Uh, it's to really I, I think that's that's so incredibly brave. I would I would absolutely be terrified all the time if I wasn't working with other creatives, and that's because always 
when we start out, you've got an idea in your head of what you want it to be, and then you start looking at the budgets and what you can afford, and then you start looking at the contractors and what they're able to actually do, and then they have a bit of a bad day, so they deliver something that's not quite what they could do, but it's what they, are, they do do, um, and it's not quite what you have in, in your head. But sometimes, if you're working with someone else, be they a brilliant um, costume designer or florist, um, then what's in their head might not be quite what, what's translated on the ground. Um, but you don't know exactly what it is, so it comes and it's greater than you even imagined. So that's quite exciting. It doesn't always happen, though, that, that it's greater than you even imagined. But I quite like the collaboration. <laughs> <laughs> it's the sort of level of freedom as well that you want to give your clients because does this, you know, if, if a client um, comes to you and it's a very nice piece of business and you want to work with them but you don't feel their level of creativity is necessarily matched with yours or is necessarily going to allow you to hit the heights of creativity that you really want to, to demonstrate your full portfolio of skills, do you say no? Do you turn the business down? Yes, I will say no. You would? Well, I think when people come to me and to my business, they come for a certain look. Yeah. So, they, I mean, if they don't like my work, they will go to someone else. So I, I have to be very confident when I sell my design. Mm. And most of the time when I draw something, when I draw a sketch, I don't think about the money. I don't think about what it costs. And when I tell them, okay, this is going to be, I don't know, like, it's a lot of money usually. <laughs> <laughs> And they're like, are you sure? But I'm so confident in the way I'm selling my design, so they usually mm. buy it. And I'm very good actually at sales because, you know, sometimes it's, okay, we have 10,000 euros for flowers. I'm like, hmm, okay. So I'm gonna draw something <laughs> and it's like 100. And they're like, oh, okay, let me think about it. But because I show it with a sketch, they feel like they have to buy it because they've seen it. Yeah. So it's pretty small, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's very important as well, and it's a lot of times at the first meeting, you know, you, you, you get this feeling from your clients that you are the, either going to go on this journey with them or you're not, you're not the right person. And, you know, you, they come to you for what you are, and if they ask for something too wacky and too not natural, and you name it, my heart is not in it. And, mm. you know, when they walk out the door, no, it's not going to be me. And I guess yeah. you've got the same as well. Same, if you get yeah. asked to do a polka dot wedding dress or whatever, you like. Sounds nice. You know? <laughs> but, you know, but your heart has to be in it so much, you know, and you yeah. will give it all. And I think with us, you know, uh, it is so important. Yeah, they come to Rob Van Helden, they want to meet me. I'm not sending just, you know, I'm there, you know, seven days a week. And I think all of us, we all control freaks, you know, and uh, we have all worked hard for what we are and where we are these days. And uh, we are nothing without the teams around us, you know, and uh, we kick off from each other as well. But, you know, it's, it, it's teamwork and it's, but what I'm coming back to is like, I always get this feeling straight away, I'm not the right person for you. Thank you for your interest, mm -hmm. but it's gonna maybe be a not this It's going to be a nightmare yes, along the way. Yeah, I'm sorry. It's like, yeah. bye-bye. You see them coming. <laughs> yeah, you, you do see them coming. And, you know, it's like you said as well. It's like, you know, they go to Valentino for a dress or they go to, you know, Primark. It's, uh, if you're known so well for doing a certain thing, does it put you in a slightly precarious position when the trend flips the other way? Because as a creative, though, you're always moving forward, aren't you? Yeah. yeah. Twist to My it. husband's always saying, you change so much. You know, like, but I, I think you do. You just move forward all the time in your style. And, and, and I think the big words that are important in the C word is, you know, is confidence and courage as a designer to believe in what you love. And I think when you're younger, it's very hard to have that. But as you get older, you become just sort of, I think this, yeah. boom, and, and you just do it. Um, plus, we have all had to deal you know, over the years. With it. There are new kids on the block you know, and new ideas and all that. And you know, there's, you know, it's hard work and it's got, it hasn't got easier, it's got harder. You know, and you still well, that's because we're getting older. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. More responsibilities. But, you know, but it's still the love that we've got for our jobs. You know, and it, that's what gets us up in the morning and you know, work seven days a week. And you know, you, you've created a name and it's hard work to keep that name. But mm. it's my love, so uh, I'm not letting it go. I think it's, a, it's a, an art um, to strike the balance of um, having a synonymous design to your brand and that's driving people to your brand but that might not be the thing that you love anymore i've certainly experienced this um, in my business and i think it's moving forward all the time um, but getting that balance that um, people still love what you did but you have to get them to love what you're doing as well 
Um, and you can only do that by creating all the time. But it does block you to, for other clients. Like if you have a certain look and they ask you, for example, to do like a bohemian wedding, mm. of course I could be able to do it, but they will look at someone else. So you block yourself from potential yeah. additional clients, I think. Okay. Is anyone going to be brave enough to admit to some creative failure? Oh, I fail all the time. <laughs> I mean, you must Many have tried times. to blow things up and it's gone horribly wrong. Yeah. I, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it's it's kind of kind of interesting this balance between what your signature is versus what you um, what you're pushing the boundaries. If you're pushing the boundaries really far out and really innovating, um, you're basically doing a live experiment, which probably isn't the right thing to do at someone's wedding. Um, <laughs> mm. We try and save the experiments for things that we're doing with brands and brand par parties because they've got, well, basically they're spending someone else's money. Um, so that really helps if something's gone wrong. Um, <laughs> um, and also when stuff does go wrong, um, like trying to put together a chocolate waterfall and a chocolate climbing wall at the same time. It's about 10 meters tall, Peter Andre tried to conquer his fear of heights, <laughs> who knew. Um, <laughs> By getting to the top of it, um, the two things that really shouldn't be combined. Um, I think I think we're trying to we're trying to back up and change out all the chocolate, which you have to do um, pretty regularly. And this is at Alton Towers, by the way. So um, it was specced as a theme park ride. The chocolate uh, backed up, went down the wrong tube, and started flowing towards the ornamental lake, in which there are all these sort of delicate <laughs> ecosystem and protected fish. Um, Alton Towers scrambled a hazmat, hazardous materials cleanup team that came, came out in all sorts of sort of scrubs um, and cleaned it up. We were ex you know, just having a heart attack about this whole thing. The, the, the fish were safe. The fish were safe. Um, and we said, God, is, it, is that okay? And they said, it's not the worst thing that's happened today, um, <laughs> which was great in terms of putting it in perspective. But um, I, think, I think if something's not right, what, what we try and do is, is um, just be really honest about it and talk to our clients about it and give them the money back mm. um, and some of our best clients have come of that um, that we've got on to do many many parties for we said look it's a bit shit sorry um, <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't quite what we imagined it was going to be um, I yeah. should say not all of our things are disasters <laughs> I just want to say that <laughs> Maybe what we're saying then is that the sort of failure is part of the process and actually Absolutely. if we were having this discussion in America we'd all be really embracing that anyway wouldn't we that that would be very much part of the journey to getting it right but um, is it harder when you're a dress designer or a shoe designer if you put a collection out there and you kind of stand back at the end and look at it and think it's not my finest or you know I, I preferred the previous season how, how do you mentally Get beyond that, then. Just look forward. Move forward. You know, look Move forward. Um, I think, to be honest, when you're designing it, you know if it's not your finest. So mm. probably wouldn't actually get to that point. Into production. I'd certainly, I'd, I don't think I would kind of do that. Would you do that? Yeah, you might just not do a shoot that year. Yeah, you <laughs> might just kind of, you know. Just taking our time. Of personal, thing. you know, if you've got your life is always rolling hills, mm. isn't it? And, and it? And it shows in your work massively. Yeah, I think we can all say that. Mm -hmm. it depends what's happening with your personal life or whatever. And when you're your happiest, your best frocks come out. I think. Mm. Um, yeah. So you know, and that's not always. Um, you're not always able to do that to a strict um, mm. kind of schedule. Business is you? hard. You've got a lot to, a lot of hats. And it, it's got its ups and downs, and you might be just, you know, absolutely bogged down with leases and legals or whatever, and it's just so dull. Uh, and you can't, re you can't really find creativeness, so you can't do everything brilliantly. You've always got a ball on the floor. Yeah. Um, so you just do make the best of whatever and keep looking forward. Does that resonate with you, John? Yeah, it does actually. Um, but I think it's important not to be reproachful about your practice. So you learn from things um, and consider it in context and and then grow from it. Uh, like it's interesting the other day I looked at a wedding I shot in 2014 in Monaco and it really elevated me at the time John Legend was at the wedding and it was it was published in many places it was fantastic and I was really proud of it and I hadn't looked at it for a few years and I looked at it again and I was surprised by the noise of, of the cameras and I was surprised by the color balancing that I'd selected and uh, and that didn't mean I think oh that you know I wasn't sort of reproachful about it, but I was thinking, well, the cameras today, five years, are so faster, so better, 
then actually a lot of the kind of blur maybe or the noise and so on they'll be gone you know but um, that's not necessarily then you kind of like be negative about what you've what you've done and I just wanted to add something as well about what Rob was saying about teams um, I, I always I think I used to think I take for t I take pictures and I don't think that anymore because this idea of taking suggests that I'm kind of like the one doing the taking like the auteur that takes so now I think I make photos and and I think I can't emphasize you like, make enough because in some of my best work is actually about, and again it's a C word, it's collaboration. You know, I've worked with Rob on shoots, I've worked with Victoria on shoots, on Mel on shoots, um, Stephen on shoots, and Amy on shoots, and Michael on shoots, on Lydia on shoots. And when you, when you work on these shoots, these, you know, there's, there's the amount of effort and time and, and collaboration that goes in. Um, when you when you conceptualise it, discuss it, look at the mood board, come in. Yeah, I might take that picture, but that creative work is actually a collaboration for me. Yeah, yeah. yeah. John Charles. Yeah. Okay, I think once you admit with yourself that you'll never be happy with your design and that you will always <laughs> want more, you will feel like okay, <laughs> this is me. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. I'm a control freak and I, yeah. you know, sometimes That's I work so hard on something and when I see the result, I, I judge myself a lot and I'm mm. like, I could have done something better. But because I know I'm like that, I'm like, just yeah. forget about yourself. Quite hard, and, quite hard being a creative person by the side of Nightmare, yeah. It's a lot of angst. Oh, it's very hard. It's hard to be creative, but it, it's not a choice, yeah. it's a need. You're yeah. like that when you're it's born, in you. so it's in you, yes. Yeah. But it takes courage, as I said, to express yourself and to show it to the world, because sometimes it's very hard. Yeah. Because we always you know, wonder, are we doing something great? Yeah. Uh, the client is going to like what we're doing? It's very public, once you've put it out there, it's out there. It's like being naked, to be judged. I think. Keeping your feet yeah. on the ground is very important and not just you know, take it all for granted and, yeah. you know, um, Life is too short. It's, yeah, yeah. Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> and that, because it's obviously very hard to be 100% creative 100% of the time, um, how do you keep it fresh? Because you, some of you are very, very experienced at what you do, and that's great, isn't it? You bring that sort of wealth of experience. But how do you motivate yourself and your teams if you feel, you know, you're inevitably sort of stuck in a rut or you're just doing what you're doing because you're very good at doing it. How do you keep the momentum going? I think C for challenge, you know? It's, uh, <laughs> Thrive, <laughs> challenge, yeah. eat lots of avocados, mm. lots, lots of energy. <laughs> yeah, no, but you know, just, just, well, I think it comes from within, it's just natural. And you kick off from to, each other. You've got yeah, to this yeah. stage, you, you are very driven and you're inspired by the world, you're moving with the times, you're into Instagram, you're doing mm. all this and you're just naturally driven and inspired, aren't you? And it's keeping that balance of, of giving yourself enough time to be balanced on everything that you need to be involved in. Mm. Um, and see the big picture, I will say. Think Hollywood and see the big picture. Yeah. yeah. The, um, the big boss at Condé Nast always says to the editors there, you have to say yes to things. And you have to be interested and you have to ask questions. And actually, if you do these things, a lot of the time you will discover that people that you didn't necessarily think were terribly interesting actually turn out to be some of the most interesting and some of the most helpful people that, that will really spur your business on. Um, also, that thing, I think, of just being quite widely read, which I know is something you've got to quite impressive library at the um, office, haven't you? Uh, yeah, for us, we've got Sawyer Memorial Library. Um, <laughs> it's dedicated to um, Alexi Sawyer, who's like a total hero of ours. Um, so we spend a lot of time ba basing stuff on history. Um, any creative challenge you've had uh, probably been surmounted by someone at some point in early in history. So the start of any process, we'll try and find the 10 best examples of it from the past. If it's from the deep past as well, it's even better um, because all the people involved in it were dead. <laughs> are dead. <laughs> so they're not going to call you up and say, you just took my idea. <laughs> and if it's 400 years ago, probably no one else has any idea about this thing that's happened. So we did, we did this, uh, um, we created in 1694, um, British Admiral Edward Russell, um, flooded a fountain in Alicante and had a party for 6,000 of his um, closest friends, who was, a, you know, it's all the members of the fleet. And it went on for six days, and they only stopped it once when it started raining, because they didn't want the punch to be diluted, so this is a huge, huge level punch. They had small boys in little boats, um, midshipmen, 
paddling around and lading out all the drinks. I was like, God, if this could happen in CC94, we must be able to make this happen now. <laughs> um, and then worked through all the um, uh, contemporary, well, food safety, food standards, um, <laughs> in order to be able to do this without poisoning everyone. <laughs> Um, and that was just through having a punch that was so alcoholic, so sweet and so acidic that you could, uh, the, our um, uh, food engineers just said you could literally throw a dead dog in it and just nothing's going to grow. It's apocalyptic. <laughs> it is, it's apocalyptic. Um, but I think when you, take that, when you take those stories from the past and then you realise them using the techniques, the technology, the collaborators that we have today, you invariably end up doing something that's, that's very new, that's very different. We're using a lot of um, you know, contemporary lighting techniques through the punch. So it didn't in any way resemble the first, um, but it gave us a story. And also, going back to selling it in, when we sat down with our clients and said, look, we've got this idea. Somehow, this thing that was utterly ludicrous, we're asking for a tonne of cognac for people to boat across, um, somehow had this sort of veneer of respectability. Because it was done in 1694, it must be okay. <laughs> Um, I want to touch on the whole pricing of creativity as well, because it's a, it's a tricky one, isn't it? Because there's so much sort of brain power and um, possibly staring out of the window and drumming up of ideas that has to happen in a very insular way sometimes, that it's difficult to put a price on or difficult to communicate to your clients the true value of it. So, Rob, how do you... How do you tackle that one? In our world, you know, people don't realise what really goes into it. Yeah, you do a proposal and with your, all your ideas and, you know, you, from your initial meeting, taking your clients to the flower market, you know, to show them around, to do sample meetings at your place and, you know, where, to show them what they're going to get on the day and everything. Um, and then to come to the actual wedding, the, a lot of people, they go to see the labor charge, they go, oh my God, boom. But they don't realize what goes into it. You know, in our world, you know, these flowers have to come in. They have to be conditioned. You know, they, uh, it's early mornings. It's, it's long days. You know, these flowers have to be treated and arranged and have to be transported and have to be the props. You know, props has become a big thing for me, you know, because budgets changed on flowers and the flower prices and everything. And you can create so much with beautiful props as well. And they need to be cleaned and they, you know, the wax needs to be taken off. And yes, there's a lot of man hours going into a job to create something special. And, but, but they just think, oh yeah, he skips to the market and plonks it in the vase <laughs> and that's it. But um, <clears throat> no, there's a lot that's involved and it's long days. And you know, staff is not cheap these days and transport and you know, it all adds up soon. So um, yeah. yeah, it needs to be covered, you know, but like I said earlier, you know, there's, there's competition out there. And, uh, you know, but you need to keep your quality that you have worked for for years onto your product and believe in yourself and you know give the, the best service that your name can give. Yeah, John Charles. I've noticed that um, the more you get paid, the more people respect you. Sometimes you know you give a design and almost for nothing, and people don't respect it and they want to change everything. Versus when you're very well paid, they treat you like a king, and that's a very big difference. And as well, I think if you, because we're talking about price, right? Yeah. So I think the more uh, you get paid, the more people think you are good for some reason. <laughs> and that <laughs> helped me, that helped me a lot in France, actually, because I was one of the first designers <laughs> daring to charge so much for my design. People thought I was arrogant and crazy. But when I started to get paid for that, people had respect. They were like, how do you dare to charge so much money for your design? And I said, because I worth it. And, and people there. Are... <laughs> Thank you. It may sound arrogant, but you know, it's actually it's a game because you have to make it look like you're certain about what you're doing, what certain about what you're selling as well. Yeah. And, and once you get very well paid, you get respected. Okay. Emmy, do you, is that the same for you? You talk to me. Yes, Emmy. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so actually this question really made me think about how we um, price our collection and how we sell it and how we justify our prices, which as probably most of you know, are quite high. Um, and it's really quite interesting because we talk about everything else that goes into creating that shoe. So we talk about the hand beaders that make our embellishments and we talk about the fact that we use the best suede on the planet. 
and talk about um, the team of craftsmen that work in our workshop and how skilled they are and the attention to detail and how everything's perfect. I never really talk about actually the time I spent to come up with it, how I've perfected the shape, how I know it's comfortable because I've tried it and I've worked out the perfect balance. And how, and how that, how, how do you put a value on that? Because that's, that, you can't see that, you experience that once you've mm. worn the shoes. So um, I'm gonna try and approach it in a different way and hope that, that this discussion makes you think about how you price your service or product um, and just allow for that bit of magic creativity and how do you talk about that and value that because actually that's the most important bit. Does it filter back onto the shop floor effectively? You have to make sure that anyone who's in the store yeah. has that real knowledge yeah. of exactly the process that's gone. Yes. It. No. They um, they de definitely from from me have that um, completely down to a T and probably deliver it better than I would because I it, you know it's more difficult talking about yourself. Um, but yeah, I'm definitely going to introduce this element because I think that that is it's so important and people need to understand that everything is designed mm. and it doesn't just appear. No, really. and it's not just made. It's very easy <laughs> to draw something that looks beautiful. The challenge is to execute that. And do you it find the clients want to know? Are they asking yes. those questions, or if they love the shoe, are they buying the shoe regardless? I think at our price point, definitely. Mm. Um, they want to know, and they want to know the story, and they want to know where it's made, who it's by, made by, um, and again, who's designed it. Mm. Okay. And see those processes, I think. Yeah. What well, Elizabeth was saying about boutiques, so I, I kind of, some years ago, I would have that kind of uh, discourse around the fact that, you know, it's a, you can't compare, it's not like for like, you know, I'm a boutique agency, you know, and they all tell the photographer, you can't kind of compare it and so on. But I kind of found I don't need to say those things anymore. And I think it's like what you were saying that, the more elevated you get and the more expensive you are, then the more respect you get, interestingly. So I've found that couples that book me respect me and couples that don't book me respect me. So the ones that don't book me are really respectful about the fact that they don't, can't book me. They love my work, for example, but I'm really afraid that I can't afford you. you know? So I kind of felt that, the kind of, and maybe that's part of PR as well, um, and the, you know, the achievements and notability that helps. Um, but there's this sort of, discourse of the, of, the, of the brand and of the story and of the achievements that say a certain thing, you know, which then, ironically, you, I, uh, you get more respect for it. Yeah. And what about protecting your creativity? Um, there must have been times, Philippa, when you've looked at other bridal collections and thought, mm, that looks familiar. Do, do you have to spend a lot of time on that kind of thing, monitoring what the competition are doing, or is that then really distracting from what you're trying to achieve yourself? It happens, and I think you have to take it as a compliment. Hopefully it's not an exact copy. Um, I think in my career it's happened once where it really was a bit too close to the bone. So I did, have, did slightly confront them, but I don't like confrontation, so. But I, I think just get on with it, whatever. It's their problem, isn't it? You know, just do what you're doing, you know? Um, yeah. yeah. What about, is there anybody else on the panel who is takes a different approach to it? Are you, I can't imagine people are copying what you do very often. <laughs> Like actually, actually, we give away lots of ideas for free because mm. um, you you rest on you have the confidence that you'll be able to have another idea, yeah, and put it out there. And also the idea as well that you know you're coming up with ideas because you've been to the latest exhibition and this, that, and the other. Um, and you know if you don't if you don't get it out into the ether, some, there's a lot of parallel thinking. Everyone's being inspired by the same things because they're forward in the public consciousness if you don't get it out there someone else will so don't mm. sit on those ideas lash them out if you get a chance to get them um then that's 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 it that's all and they've still got to be able to do them so even if you've put the idea out there it's somebody has to be capable of producing the goods yeah, generally they can't do it as well as you anyway so it's not going to yeah so yeah much experience i think um certainly 
in journalism and when you're editing a magazine, a bridal magazine, that's something that happens all the time. You look at the competition and think, wow, oh, same font, same layout, same <laughs> idea. But what, you know, really, what can you do about it? You're, by that point, you're already on to the next yeah. issue, so it doesn't matter, does it? Drives you forward more, doesn't it? Just think, well, oh, they're copying. Yeah. It. Better it. I've tried something that didn't work, but I'm going to share it with you. I was sending my design, my sketches, and then with a contract that says it's like a non-disclosure agreement, if they didn't want to use it, they couldn't uh, replicate my design. But it didn't work because, you know, some, everybody gets inspired from everything. But yeah. what I love doing with my brides, because I do mostly weddings, uh, when, I tell, when they tell me I want to show you my Pinterest mood board, I tell them, don't show me any pictures of any weddings. I want to see um, which brands you like, mm. uh, interior design, stuff like that, but no wedding, no events. You don't want to be influenced. I try not to. Well, mm. I will be lying because sometimes I'm looking at like, people that I admire, but I try to refrain myself from being inspired because I want to create something unique. Yeah. And that's very hard because yeah. there's so many things going on, so it's hard. Yeah. But it's the best way to ask for a bride not to show you um, other weddings, other events, but something else, like yeah. brands, and that's yeah. great. That's not the way I work. But okay. um, uh, signing them a non-disclosure agreement didn't work. Yeah. It was too complicated. <laughs> and I think the follow-up to those things is very complicated and potentially costly for you, isn't it? So it's not necessarily practical. But what you can do is, uh, sorry, what you can yeah. do is uh, you don't work and you don't show anything until you haven't been paid. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> it you all will comes back client, to money. Obviously, but the clients <laughs> who really want you, they'll pay you. So. Yeah, okay. We're running out of time, sadly. Thank you. Thank you.